Daniel and I got to stay here tonight. For a couple nights. Why? Uh, our place is getting fumigated. What? We got bed bugs, apparently. I don't have them on me. Why don't you just get a hotel? I don't have the funds for that right now. If you're anything like me, your mom has been on your case about getting a real job for over a decade, but you've been consistent about going to bat for the art life, defending all the side gigs you've juggled to subsidize it, and hyping all the work you've been able to get done over the years. All that said, it is getting harder to rebut her points about financial ruin and the social drawbacks of continuing to vlog at the amateur level in your 30s. If somebody told you they had bed bugs, would you assume that it was on their person or just on, on around in their mattress? I mean, I would say not necessarily not on, their, on their person. I mean, right. it could be like on their bag. Like it, it, there are other ways it could be brought in. So. Right, but not. you wouldn't think that it was on their person. On their skin. Okay. Yeah, you can't cool. really clap Thank back you. with I'm following my dreams anymore. You're an adult. For better or worse, you are living those dreams. And if they're nightmares, I don't know what to tell you. Que sera, sera, you know? You signed up for this. And hey, at least they're of your own making and you've probably cultivated enough skill to weave them into your work moving forward. Anyway, you're 35 now and seeing as you don't plan on changing course anytime soon, it's time to start justifying your life choices in an adult way. If you've been successful convincing yourself that you are indeed an artist and that material success was never a given, it'll make things easier. Do you like Man on the Street segments? Do y'all feel like Man on the Street segments could be elevated to an art form? In a world overrun by Philistines, recognition of good art is the exception, not the rule. And not only should your obscurity not come as a surprise, it shouldn't factor into the argument at all. All you have to do is maintain that the pursuit itself was and continues to be worthwhile. Jesus. You've probably heard it before. Uh, haters will say something to the effect of what you do is selfish and pointless. You would be of more value to society if you got a real job. We can deconstruct this indictment piecemeal and I'm gonna do it backwards, but first we're gonna wanna go ahead and subscribe to Plato's Theory of Forms or it won't work. Uh, spiritual or not, as a self-proclaimed artist trying to justify your efforts, it just helps to operate as if ultimate reality exists beyond the physical world. And if you need a hand with that, you can consider philosopher Iris Murdoch's claim that what is truly beautiful is inaccessible and cannot be possessed or destroyed. The statue is broken, the flower fades, the experience ceases, but something has not suffered from decay and mortality. And that thing would be the object's property of being, which we're gonna say belongs to some transcendent reality. Perfection isn't observable here on earth, but the true artist is indisputably drawn to it in his futile attempts to measure up. So yeah, the source of that pull is beyond our physical world. Cool? Does anybody ever watch things? That's not really my problem. Um, yeah, once you find the rhetoric to sell Plato's world of being, you can then kneecap your haters' use of the designation real in real job by forcing them to question whether a salaried position is any more real than say making a living selling used panties on sniffer you should open up a burner account of your girlfriends on OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. just you know take pictures of her feet and pass them by boom and don't forget link it to uh, your youtube yeah all oh, right yeah. everything sure has to be your bio like, well yeah she's an ex now oh, so that ex. yeah so that would be, be hard to get that would be hard well, they're the the ethics murdoch has her misgivings about romanticism namely its self-directedness uh, but she does maintain the idea that we use our imagination not to escape the real world, but to join it. And I'm agreeing with that, as should you, for the purposes of our argument. Okay, so now we can target what our haters mean by value. Uh, would I be of more value to society, for instance, if I actually used my journalism degree? Fortunately for me, the answer is not necessarily I hate the news. So yeah, if we maintain Murdoch's claim that good art 
invigorates our best faculties and reveals what we're usually too self-absorbed and or timid to recognize then our art if it is indeed good provides value to compatibly minded consumers and that it presents a truthful if exaggerated and or stylized image of the human condition in a form that can be steadily contemplated in a world where art and nature are the only context a lot of us are even capable of contemplating it and as to the point of contemplating the human condition i don't know that there is one uh, but that clears the way for our offensive on the hater stance that what we do is pointless. This one's the easiest to pick off. You just flip the script because whatever the hater does to get ahead in the rat race is also pointless. The difference, according to Murdoch, is that the pointlessness of art is not the pointlessness of a game. It is the pointlessness of human life itself. And form in art is properly the simulation of the self-contained aimlessness of the universe. All right, finally we arrive at the selfishness of our artistic pursuits. And I'm inclined to let the haters have this one, seeing as a lot of my work is self-directed, and even my more self-deprecating stuff seems to have some underlying artifice. But Murdoch insists that good art not only transcends selfish and obsessive limitations of personality, but that it can also enlarge the sensibility of its consumer, and in effect be a kind of goodness by proxy. She does make clear, however, that good art can't guarantee the quality of its consumer's consciousness, and that most art isn't good. Most art is self-consoling fantasy. So what if your art falls into that latter category, and you are just a hack squandering your human potential doodling derivative anime porn in a sketchbook for most of your waking life? Don't worry. We can still argue that that is blameless if you do, in fact, love hentai. Yeah. There, so I can drink some tea. Sir, do you like hentai? Anime porn? It doesn't need social utility to be worthwhile, right? I love that, thank you. Sure, it's important to take morality into account when we consider how our attitudes and immediate behavior affect other people. You shouldn't be focusing on sketching tentacles and coochies while your toddler is playing by a body of water. For instance, you should probably be keeping an eye on the kid. My contention though is with people who argue that the demands of morality should override all other interests and considerations regarding how to conduct my life. I find it intellectually lazy uh, but you know, I'm thinking a lot of these people may just not have the time to reflect on these things like I do, owing to time constraints imposed by things like proverbial real jobs and children, uh, things I know nothing about. And none of that is to say that a lot of the people who fall into this category don't lead virtuous and or rewarding lives. I'm just saying their way isn't the only way to achieve virtue and or reward. Morality seems like a finite point, you know, like when you make art from that kind of you know, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like it has longevity, yeah. It's art that is, it does, isn't bound by those confines, it's like timeless. Yeah, it, it, it's, it starts in a realm that's not here, so you know, when you transfer it to this realm, you try to put those bounds on it, it just it it makes it kind of commercial and cheesy. As Harry G. Frankfurt points out, being moral may be an indispensable condition for a satisfying life. It is certainly not. However, the only condition that is indispensable. Consider the people you know who are super moral but have other defects of character. Maybe they're emotionally shallow or too uninspired to enrich their own lives, let alone those of the people around them. These people might not leave the world worse than how they found it, but you could argue it won't be much better. But better and worse aside, it's not how the world is, but that it is that's mystical. You know, while we're here, why not, you know, dress up for the party? Why be boring if you can help it? Anyway, Frankfurt also says that people who put too much emphasis on morality, re how to live, oversimplify things when they think the only alternative to submitting to moral requirements is to allow themselves to be driven by self-interest. But there are plenty of people out there devoting themselves to non-moral ideals as ends in and of themselves, that is, without considering morality or personal gain. Sure, I do post some poetry, uh, the stuff I find amusing and or relatable on TikTok, 
in hopes of going viral again. But the bulk of my work is sequestered in notebooks that I keep under lock and key, never to be read by anyone, including me. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of cringe I've written that I have no desire to revisit, and that cringe wasn't born from ambition or a moral impulse. It was a byproduct of my way of being, my compliance to whatever compels me to create. We can judge people for their parenting skills, but we generally don't judge them for continuing to love their kids even when the kids grow up to be monsters. We can judge a monster for preying on innocence, but we don't judge it for running from villagers with torches and pitchforks. We get the self-preservation thing, even if the thing preserving itself sucks. There are exceptions, of course, but parental love and love of life are pretty ubiquitous, and more to the point, they're blameless. So too is committing to the art life if it is in fact a command of love. So how do you know if you actually love what you do? Love, as Professor Frankfurt defines it, is most centrally a disinterested concern for the existence of what is loved and for what is good for it. The lover desires that his beloved flourish and not be harmed, and he does not desire this just for the sake of promoting some other goal. Frankfurt goes on to say that as far as human relationships go, parental love for their children comes closest to offering recognizably pure instances of the phenomenon. He disqualifies romantic love altogether as it is not, in essence, a mode of disinterested concern. Even the healthiest romantic relationships fall into a gray area and the exchanging of notes is a matter of course, more flowers, less nagging, more quality time, less codependence, more sex, less teeth, etc., etc., etc. We don't ask anything of our callings. A painter who truly loves painting isn't having sex with the canvas 99.99% of the time. He is birthing something onto it. And in that way, uh, his love for the art is more in line with Frankfurt's exemplar, parental love. So yeah, the next time my mom questions whether my passion projects are ruining her chances of being a grandmother, and she tries to set me up with a stable blonde who works for a grassroots political action committee, I'll tell her to slow her roll because the next lady I devote any time or energy to is gonna have to compete with the werewolf android feature I've been slaving over the past two years. And yeah, odds are she won't be stable. What we truly love, as Frankfurt attests, is not up to us. And that of course begs the question, uh, why is it so important to pursue what you love if it curtails your freedom? And the answer is because in a similar vein to loving our life even if it sucks, and our offspring even if they suck, we love loving even if what we love happens to suck. This is presumably why our ex-girlfriends have unruly dogs that they don't have the bandwidth for. They adopted them at a time when they felt like they needed to imbue their life with more meaning, uh, to have something to love, and they wanted to have something to love precisely because it put constraints on them, forced them out of bed in the morning to feed and walk the dogs if you weren't around to do it for them. Excuse me, is that your girlfriend's dog? And this is because humans by nature need final ends. Why do we need final ends? Uh, to have something worthwhile to do with our time. Loving something can give us direction and it can do wonders battling the malaise that is indecisiveness. Uh, if you have dogs you love, you know at least in part what your morning and evening routines are gonna look like. And having the compulsion to write a monster movie, I know what films to study, I know what lore to read, and I know what I'm writing when I sit down at the computer. So yeah, basically we love loving things because otherwise our lives would feel arbitrary and ultimately we would get bored. Uh, I know everyone says life is short, but I'm finding it pretty long and having more things to love would help pass the time. And I know boredom may sound a bit trivial here, but Frankfurt says that avoiding it isn't just owing to how unpleasant it is, but that it's a profound human need. He argues that fighting boredom expresses a primitive urge for psychic survival and that it relates to self-preservation in the literal sense of sustaining not the life of the organism, but the persistence and vitality of the self. And I find that all very compelling, but telling my mom I vlog for self-preservation doesn't track for her. She's more concerned with my organism than she is with my self. Does your mom approve 
of your art? She's happy. I'm embracing my talent, but you know, old school parents, they want you to have a nine to five job. Yes, my so mom too. So it's hard trying to convince them that I can make a living off of selling my artwork. So. And I get it. Yeah, she can't help but catastrophize. Uh, the last good morning text I got from her was just a link to an article uh, about some local guy who died of a brain eating amoeba. And I asked, oh no, do we know him? Uh, do I need to give anyone my condolences? And she said no, but that he was around my age and to be careful. I know that when she sees me devoting all this energy to unmonetized video essays like this, she's seeing a grown man throwing away his time and sealing his fate. And my fate, as I'm sure she extrapolates, is to be broke and alone, probably turning tricks behind the Hardys on Abernathy Road. I don't think I'll ever get into prostitution, but for the most part, I have no problem working gigs that people with mainstream sensibilities may find less than ideal. I'm pursuing my excellence in other areas. But you know, seeing as anything capable of demonstrating excellence must show it in its own distinct way. Excellence in essence is very difficult to sell. Naturally, my mom would like to see mine on SNL or The Voice uh, because you know, like most people, she's susceptible to the social proof bias, but I have to go my own way. And uh, I'm not saying my way is uncharted necessarily, I'm just saying it won't always be on the rails and it definitely won't be on NBC. And yeah, of course there's a chance I end up broken alone, you could say that of anyone, uh, but I can't feel like I've squandered my life if the only thing I would do differently is the same thing smarter. Okay, so let's assume I'm not tricking myself and my writing is in fact a command of love, whether it be poetry, essay, or the unsolicited screenplays I send to David Boreanaz's residential address, a piece of intel I got for my birthday last year from a source that I made a blood oath never to reveal. And let's say that I'm compelled to continue writing in some form without any assurance of recognition or monetary gain. Does that make for a good life? If I had to answer that today, given the string of failures that has been the past 15 years, I would say absolutely not, but that's not really the point. Spinoza says that self-love or being satisfied with yourself is really the highest achievement anyone can hope for. I've put a lot of thought into this and I agree. And the only way to be satisfied with yourself if you happen to have a calling is to answer it, unfortunately. Does your mom approve of your raison d'etre? I don't know what that is. How are you calling? Do you have a calling? Hey, buddy. Yeah, okay, lucky you. So yeah, that settles it, I think. Uh, I'm sorry if that was a bummer. Um, if you don't see me on your feet again, have a good, or have, a, have your life. Have your life. <laughs>